Hey, 42 here. Can you believe how close we are to Christmas? My, how the year flies when the whole world is going to shit. If you started looking ahead to the festive period, you're probably imagining opening presents, making awkward small talk with cousins you rarely see and secretly hate, or eating so much turkey, a meat you don't even like very much, that a single waffe thin mint would make you explode. Then there are the images we associate with Christmas, like snowmen, reindeer, Christmas trees, a big fat man dressed all in red who smells suspiciously like mummy, and of course, the nativity scene. This last one is particularly interesting. Since it's become the last refuge for the few remaining religious symbols associated with a holiday that has become increasingly commercialized and distanced from its religious meaning. So, why do millions of staunch atheists still adorn their houses with angels, shepherds, and cherubs, or as I like to call them, magic babies, on Christmas Day? Tradition is the simple answer. And to most people, that's a perfectly good reason to get out the magic babies. After all, shouldn't everyone, believers or not, be allowed to display whatever they want in their windows and on their mantelpieces come Christmas Day? Well, maybe. But it's a safe bet that anyone who wanted to fill their windows with pentagrams and horned devils as a nod to their devout Satanism might get a few complaints from the neighbours. So why the double standards? Are we really as open to different belief systems and viewpoints as we like to think we are? The honest answer is probably not. In late 2018, Republican state representative Terry Bryant was so outraged by a certain religious sculpture installed in the Illinois Capitol Rotunda alongside a nativity scene that she introduced a House resolution condemning the display. But why did the American Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family and Property protest against this particular sculpture instead of preaching a Christian message of acceptance? After all, it was based on a scene from the Bible because the sculpture depicted a serpent coiled around an outstretched arm holding an apple with a plaque that read, Knowledge is the greatest gift. It was the result of a $1,500 crowdfunding campaign set up by a branch of the Satanic Temple. Despite their name, the Satanic Temple aren't really devil worshippers. In their own words, they're a group of like-minded individuals on a mission to encourage benevolence and empathy amongst all people, reject tyrannical authority, advocate practical common sense, oppose injustice, and undertake noble pursuits. They're a religious group that don't believe in a god, but do believe in, amongst other things, seeing religious freedom applied fairly across all religions, not just the biggest ones. And their 2018 Snake-tivity installation wasn't their first action fighting for justice across religions either. In 2013, a Christian group was given permission to hand out Bibles at public high schools in Orange County, Florida. The ruling that allowed this also naturally and fairly allowed for any non-Christian groups to do the same. The lawmakers probably had the bigger religions in mind when they made this ruling. Islam, Judaism, perhaps Mormonism. What they probably didn't expect was for the satanic temple to rock up and start distributing their own promotional material. The Satanic Children's Big Book of Activities. In what seems to be true satanic temple style, they managed not only to give the establishment a good old-fashioned two-fingered salute, the book features a connect the dots inverted pentagram, but also to quietly go about spreading their own values. A page of anagrams instructs children to help Damien, presumably named after the Antichrist character from the Omen films, to use inclusive language to reason with a group of bullies. The jumbled words include empathy, justice, freedom, and respect, which to be honest sound more like the teachings of the Messiah than the values of a very naughty boy. The group rarely misses an opportunity to have a bit of fun with their message. Like in 2012 when the Oklahoma government installed a Ten Commandments monument on the grounds of the state capitol building. If one religious statue was allowed, 
why not another? The Satanic Temple ran a successful crowdfunding campaign to commission an eight and a half foot statue of the goat-headed deity Baphomet, once apparently worshipped by the Knights Templar, to be donated and displayed right alongside the Ten Commandments. A legal challenge to the Ten Commandments monument followed, with the State Supreme Court later ruling the commandments be removed. This meant plans to install Baphomet were put on hold, and the winged goat, as well as the pentagrammed throne and two smiling children who accompany him, were saved for later use. But as the old saying goes, you can't keep a good goat-headed deity down, and in 2017 when Arkansas wanted to install their own Ten Commandments monument on the grounds of their state capitol building, back came Baphomet. The statue even made the Satanic Temple a prophet when, in 2018, Netflix used a likeness of it in its series Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. The church promptly sued, with the case settled out of court for an undisclosed fee. The Satanic Temple were given credit for their unusual contribution to the show in all future broadcasts. Wherever there are religious loopholes, the Satanic Temple aims to exploit them. So, when the Supreme Court ruled against a group championing the separation of church and state, and preserved the right of the town of Greece, New York, to open its monthly board meetings with a prayer, the Satanic Temple and other groups like them saw not a blow, but an opportunity. The ruling contained an important caveat that these prayers couldn't discriminate amongst religions. It wasn't the Satanic Church who stepped up to the plate this time, but another organisation with similar objectives. On September the 18th, 2019, in Homer, Alaska, Pastor Barrett Fletcher, wearing a colander on his head, solemnly opened a local government meeting with these words. A few of the assembly members seem to feel that they can't do this work without being overseen by a higher authority. So, I'm called to invoke the power of the true inebriated creator of the universe, the drunken tolerator of the all lesser and more recent gods, and maintainer of gravity here on Earth. May the great flying spaghetti monster rouse himself from his stupor and let his noodly appendages ground each assembly member in their seats. Ramen. It turns out that Barrett Fletcher is a pastafarian. That is, a member of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Another religion created to hold some of the preachier faiths accountable. And though it sounds like nonsense, pastafarianism is now a recognised religion in many places having come a long way since it was founded almost 15 years prior to Barrett's prayer. At the start of 2005, Kansas's school system stood at the brink of scientific disaster. The Kansas State Board of Education was considering a change to its school's curriculum, specifically relating to how evolution was taught. The proposed curriculum was to include intelligent design, the pseudo-scientific argument that God must exist because the complex features of living things, and the universe in general, could only have been created by some form of higher power, an intelligence designer. The Education Board was considering giving this theory equal teaching alongside actual science like the theory of evolution. As a logical human being, Bobby Henderson, a 24-year-old who'd recently graduated in physics from Oregon State University, was opposed to these changes. He was not at all alone in his view. Many people were outraged at the proposals, and local scientific groups organised a boycott of the hearings to avoid lending them any legitimacy. But Bobby saw an opportunity to use the logic of the conservative Christians against them. A decade before the Satanic Temple would probe decisions like these for loopholes, Bobby Henderson went all out. In an open letter to the Board of Education, Henderson outlined his beliefs in a deity called the Flying Spaghetti Monster. The FSM, he argued, was the true supernatural creator of the universe. 
and who was to say otherwise? As he pointed out, his beliefs were equally valid as anyone else's, and just as impossible to prove as, for example, the validity of intelligence design. Carbon dating is typically a problem area for so-called young Earth creationists who believe the world to be just 10,000 years old because dating of the oldest rocks on our planet suggests it's actually four and a half billion years old. Is science right? Or did God put down all those old looking rocks in a single day 10,000 years ago just to f with us? Henderson offers a third option. Whenever a scientist performs a measurement like carbon dating, the all-knowing flying spaghetti monster is there, changing the results with his noodly appendages. Disprove that, Kansas! Henderson's point was a simple one, and he summed it up perfectly in the conclusion of his letter, saying, I think we can all look forward to the time when these three theories are given equal time in our science classrooms across the country and eventually the world. One third time for intelligent design, one third time for flying spaghetti monsterism, and one third time for logical conjecture based on overwhelming observable evidence. When the education board failed to reply to Henderson's reasoned points, he published a letter online where it promptly blew up the internet. His satirical argument was the perfect banner to unite proponents of logic against religion's presence in schools, government, and other areas it simply doesn't belong. Pastafarianism quickly grew into a cultural phenomenon, and Henderson embraced the attention the movement was getting, building on his letter by writing The Gospel of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, published by Villard, amongst reported interest from half a dozen different publishers. Several other authors have since published works further building on the literature of the religion. Amongst them, The Amazing Stories of the Flying Spaghetti Monster by Cameron Pierce, a series of origin stories for the deity that sees it meet Jehovah, Buddha, Cthulhu, and of course, Charlie Sheen. According to the editor, it's best enjoyed with Italian food and a side of Darwinism. But it's Henderson's own book that gives us the best insight into his unusual deity, an invisible floating mass of spaghetti wrapped around two large meatballs, its eyes set on two protruding stalks. Here we learn the Pastafarian explanation for things like gravity, which is the result of every object in the universe being simultaneously pushed by the flying spaghetti monster's noodles, and global warming which has a particularly airtight explanation that mocks the mixing of correlation and causation. Pirates, who are said to be divine beings and the original Pastafarians, have declined in number over the last 200 years, whilst global temperatures have risen. Pirates, therefore, must keep the planet cool. This conclusion is further backed up by the fact that International Talk Like a Pirate Day, Ahoy! September the 19th, has been cooler than another scientifically chosen day, July the 10th, for at least the past few years that Henderson has bothered to check. Pirates have another role to play in the Pastafarian world. They're our ancestors. Whilst mainstream scientists suggest that we evolve from primates, with whom we share 99% of our DNA, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster rightly points out that we share significantly more of our DNA, over 99.9% .9 with pirates. This, by the way, is why you'll often see Pastafarians dressed in pirate regalia. Despite all the silliness, the Church is keen to be taken seriously, or at least seriously enough to have a genuine impact when pointing out the contradictions in other religions. In the Q&A section of its website, the very first question addressed is, is this a joke? The answer is a resounding no. Whilst many Pastafarians don't literally believe the world was formed by an invisible Kabi creator, many followers of other religions don't believe all their scripture is literally true either. Does every Christian believe everything in the Bible? Absolutely not. 
Many historians from Christian scripture are taken to be just that, stories created to demonstrate the teachings of God, not necessarily historical recordings of real events. Blind faith in every aspect of a religion isn't essential to be a true believer in most people's eyes, and that's exactly how it works with Pastafarianism. Openly acknowledging their scripture is intentionally outlandish and contradictory is just one way Pastafarians are keen to differentiate themselves from mainstream religions. Henderson proudly points out that no wars have been fought in the name of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, and he's keen to seed the church's future growth with positive ideas, namely keeping religion separate from education and keeping money out of religion. That's why joining the church doesn't cost anything, and why it doesn't ask its followers for funds. There are no physical places of worship to visit, and the church lives entirely online or in informal gatherings, where those ideals are further propagated. There aren't strict commandments either, but Henderson's Gospel does lay down eight I'd really rather you didn't. They include not judging or offending people, making sure you've eaten before challenging bigoted misogynistic hateful ideas, and not spending millions on building churches, temples, mosques or shrines when that money could be used for any of ending poverty, curing diseases, living in peace, loving with passion, and lowering the cost of cable. Pastafarians have gone to great lengths to get their religion recognised across the world, with some success. In 2016, the world's first Pastafarian marriage was celebrated in New Zealand. Of course, marriage isn't the only perk of official religious recognition, which is why a man in Austria was allowed to wear a particular piece of religious headgear in his driver's license photo in 2011. A colander, in tribute to his pasta-based god. The Czech Republic and the US states of Utah and Massachusetts are amongst the other places who have approved the colander as a piece of religious clothing. Whilst in 2014, Christopher Schaefer was sworn into the town council of Pomfret, New York, with a pasta strainer perched proudly on his head. If either the ideals or the downright craziness of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster appeal to you, joining is easy. There isn't a formal membership process, and according to their website, anyone with an interest is welcome to consider themselves an official member of the church. And even better, Pastafarianism offers what can only be described as an industry-leading policy as part of their God Back Guarantee, which states that you can try Pastafarianism for 30 days, and if unsatisfied, your own God will most likely take you back. Fervent followers are also encouraged to practice their own special brand of evangelism, with Flying Spaghetti Monster promotional material often featuring the image touched by his noodly appendage, a parody of Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam. This frequently finds its way onto Pastafarian floats at parades or leaflets offering students a choice on college campuses. Would you rather go to hell for drinking alcohol and having sex, or go to Flying Spaghetti Monster Heaven, which is rumoured to contain a beer volcano and a stripper factory? If that sounds like a pretty clear choice, you can take things one step further than simply joining the church. The maintenance of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster website is funded by very reasonably priced certificates of ordination, allowing you to preside over ceremonies such as marriages and baptisms, perform last rites, cast out false prophets, and perform exorcisms, all in the name of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Hell or be a volcano? I know which one I'd choose. Thanks for watching. You can now buy my new book, Stick a Flag in It, on Amazon, or get the audiobook on Audible. You'll find a link to both in the description below. Thank you.